No formal information from the investigation was released, but we can speculate that based on the time period, you could have just said, B! I was waiting for him to fly away and then he Love there. nature, <laughs> love nature. And remember, don't go <laughs> like I just did with bees because you want to get stung? That's how you get stung. Hello, welcome to Scott's Odyssey. We've done quite a few episodes talking about the local history and many sites that include the industrial boom of the Iron Age, the furnaces, the forges, canals, railroads, and the settlements that grew within those sites. Today, we're gonna to stop at a location that shows remnants of the quarries and what became of these huge holes the people of that era put into the ground. This is the blue hole. See you in a minute. Welcome back. At Geocache GC352P9, and just a half mile from the Lower Trail Granis Station, this is the Gannister Blue Hole. Chartered in 1902 by the Blair Limestone Company and the Clareton Steel Company by none other than John King McClanahan, the St. Clair Limestone Company went into action in 1907 with this quarry. Located on the edge of Catherine Township and just a hop, skip and jump away from Williamsburg, Pennsylvania, this location is a quarry for the excavation of Gannister. Gannister is a very hard, fine-grained quartzo sandstone called orthoquartzite. It's used in the manufacture of high-quality silica brick used in furnaces. In the 1880s, the biggest issue with furnaces was that the strength of fire clay brick was lacking sustainability and often resulted in the constant replacement of those bricks, which brought about downtime for active furnaces. Isaac Rees knew of the successful manufacture process of an improved refractory silica brick in Wales. He brought this process to America and pioneered the silica brick experimentation that led to the creation of ganister silica bricks. The word ganister is a word with a Germanic origin, meaning spark, which miners coined while excavating this rock because the ganister would make sparks when struck with the iron tools. By 1915, silica brick made of ganister, clay, and lime were the only form of fire brick being used for furnaces and forges, and almost all of their material came out of central Pennsylvania. This site operated from 1907 until March 8, 1927, when a premature explosion took the lives of four quarrymen in an exploration tunnel seeking more ganister at the bottom of the quarry. Four men were killed, Four were seriously injured and pulled from the tunnel, and five others in a different section of the quarry escaped the disaster. The explosion is purported to have been heard over three miles away, and the local houses were rocked by the explosion. Of the men whom were killed, Lucino Calderon, Rafael Borodinelli, Giovanni Alosi, and Angelo Cioli, were engaged in the process of packing the explosives into the drilled holes within the tunnel prior to any fuses being attached. No formal information from the investigation was released, but we can speculate that based on the time period, they were using a typical process of packing dynamite, not to be confused with TNT, specific for mining rock. Dynamite was able to be detonated by hot flame, blasting caps, or unfortunately, a spark. It wasn't until the early 1930s when the quarry became full of water, at which point locals started taking interest in this beautiful and clear to the bottom hole as a recreational swimming hole. At 1245 on Thursday, April 25, 1935, a prominent citizen of Hollidaysburg drove his car down a 50-foot embankment directly into the Gannister Blue Hole. According to local witnesses, someone was driving a brown sedan back and forth along Wirtz Road and seemed to be in a decidedly hurry about this roundabout travel. 
no particular attention was paid to his antics until about 1 p.m., when locals heard a loud crash near the quarry. Wassel Jokesen, whom lived 100 feet away from the quarry, heard the noise and went running toward the sound. When he arrived, he stated he saw water boiling up from the middle of the pool, with oil covering the surface. Within a few minutes, Jokesen saw a man's gray hat appear on the water. Mike Wapner, another resident, was told by Jokesen of what was seen. He appeared at the quarry along with John Kaysen and Andrew Holmesy. The men scrambled down over the embankment to recover the hat and Holmesy rushed back home to telephone Coroner Chester C. Rothrock and the state police barracks. State Trooper Corporal H.C. Johnson arrived at the quarry and immediately began an investigation. Marks along the cliff embankment, a small piece of car bumper, the hat, and the continuation of oil bubbling up from the pool gave Johnson conclusive evidence that someone had driven into the quarry. A plan was set on how to dredge the pool with the assistance of A.L. Carberry of Holidaysburg and his employees who operated a wrecking service. The dredging began at 3.30 p.m. and ran into multiple difficulties due to the steepness of the embankment. The car was finally hooked at 5.15 p.m. and unfortunately dislodged itself from the hooks. The next attempt was more successful when a spare tire and a wheel came to the surface of the water. The third attempt produced a headlight and a license plate reading 9508N. Trooper Johnson took the plate number and while instructing someone on whom to call on the telephone was approached by Mrs. Mary Oakes and her son William, age 20. The Oakes arrived at the quarry after hearing that a brown car had been seen going down the embankment. When Trooper Johnson gave the license plate to Mrs. Oakes, she stated that it was her husband's car and it was a peerless sedan, brown in color. The fourth attempt only produced a bumper. At this point, a flat bottom boat owned by Art Walls was brought into the mix and was put onto the pool using the wrecker. The boat was used to set up and convey a series of tow lines in the middle of the pool to continue the dredging. The Williamsburg Volunteer Fire Department and workers from the Penn Central Power Station gave assistance by providing hooks, lights, cable, and other tools to enable Carberry to recover the vehicle. Word of this tragedy spread across the area like wildfire, and within several hours, thousands of people were at the quarry's edge watching from every vantage point of the dredging operation. Troopers William J. Witzel, F.G. McCartney, J.H. Critchfield, Sheriff Wald, Deputy Harvey, and police officers from Williamsburg and Holidaysburg arrived on site to maintain order of the curious crowd that manifested in this event. Many attempts to pull the car from the pool proved unsuccessful. At 9.20 p.m., the car was finally hooked and pulled up the side of the embankment. Surprisingly, there was little damage. The windows in the car were all closed and still intact, with the exception of the driver's side window being part way down. The people, at this point a mob, surged toward the car, and an excited man, one of the first to the car, picked up a rock and smashed the window to let the water out. However, as the water started to come out of the window, seated behind the steering wheel was the lifeless body of John W. Oakes. His glasses were found on the floor unbroken, he was fully dressed, and his body bore no marks of an injury. The death of John W. Oakes was ruled a suicide based on the manner in which the incident unfolded, the condition of the body and the vehicle, and the statements made by Mrs. Oakes regarding John W. Oakes' comments about taking his own life during the preceding weeks. Believe it or not, this site ultimately became an extremely active recreational pool for the locals from the 1930s until about the late 1980s. On Wednesday, July 17, 1968, the Blue Hole took another life. Brothers Gary and Claire Parks were with another boy and decided to take a raft on the Blue Hole at night around 11 p.m. While on the pool, Gary W. Parks fell into the water. He went under and he never came back up. 
Gary's body was recovered by scuba divers at 6.55 a.m. Thursday, July 18, 1968. The reason for death was labeled a drowning, and apparently Gary didn't know how to swim. There are quite a few of these old quarries throughout this area, and most of them have had at least one fatal accident. Fortunately, the popularity of swimming in these quarries has declined over time due to personal swimming pools, local lakes, and a general disinterest in going into abandoned locations. That doesn't mean there isn't anyone still visiting these sites, just that the numbers of people and incidents have declined dramatically. Although there are no freshwater streams, rivers, creeks, or springs at this hole, there are a large number of crappies living in this standing water. Presumably, they've been tossed in by someone who wanted a really nice fishing hole. Within this blue hole, other than the fish, there's a tunnel where the miners chase the root veins of their ganister, a school bus, full-size van, a laptop, a black rotary telephone, as well as other assorted garbage tossed into the hole over the years. At this point, the Blue Hole is mainly used by divers as a water diving training location. As with all locations regarding history and all things on this earth, after something is created, it inevitably dies and it changes its form and purpose into something different that becomes a niche for something else to fill. Unfortunately, the splendor of this natural process and the beauty created produces an equal amount of danger that often doesn't get seen by the visitors and ultimately ends in tragedy. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Do me a favor, leave some comments. Tell me what you liked, tell me what you didn't like. Tell me what you'd like to see. Give me a thumbs up. Share me. Watch my videos. Subscribe to me. Hit the little bell. That way you get the notifications. Keep coming on these odysseys. For all of those who have already done this, I thank you a lot. So much. But keep leaving comments. I want to interact with you. Well, until next time. Wolf. That was cool, and it's not on camera. Sorry, something fell off the top of the quarry. It was spectacular. Sorry you missed it. <laughs> it is as stupid does. Even when I try to goof off a little bit, you get injuries because that's how nature works. It's always intelligent to be prepared for things. This here is an alcohol wipe to take care of a little bit of a scratch. Not the major, not now. In a day, I'm a little bit irri irritated. In a couple of days, yep. A couple of weeks, there goes the arm. Who needs an arm? Tell you who needs an arm. I need an arm. You need an arm. We all need our arms. Does it hurt? <laughs> like a son of a gun. But no pain, no gain. <laughs> I'm accountable for my actions. I injured myself. I got pain. What's rub it again. <laughs> I'll, I'll rub it again. Rubbing it. See? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
it burns. Come on, sissy, do it. It burns. <laughs> Part of the Odyssey. Just think the people that did this long before us, they had gouges and they would put gunpowder on it and burn it closed. And I'm crying <laughs> because, you know, alcohol wipes, they hurt scratches. <laughs> <laughs>